Today is the day. It is the day that I dread more than almost any other on the calendar because it is quarterback ranking day. If you hadn't noticed based on some of my work earlier this draft season, I don't have a great track record in terms of predicting quarterback success. But I'm not alone there because, quite frankly, most people do not have a great track record of predicting quarterback success. Even the league itself might only hit on 30% of first round quarterbacks, and that's taking data points from the last decade of drafts. So I'm not alone in terms of getting this position wrong. Most people do. Some people are better at it than others. I tend to, uh, well, let's just say when I miss, I miss big. And hopefully I've learned from some of my lessons in terms of those misses on Mahomes and Herbert and to a degree, Josh Allen. I, I, then again, I don't think anybody predicted Josh Allen being Josh Allen, but hey, that's neither here nor there. We're gonna kind of take a little bit more of a loose format for this ranking special compared to all the other offensive position groups because like I mentioned earlier this draft cycle, quarterback success does kind of fall into where you get drafted more than anything else. Obviously, talent helps, work ethic helps, medical luck helps, you know, just not getting injured, I think is a big factor for some of these guys. But where you go is obviously going to be the biggest determining factor in terms of career success, at least for the quarterback position. That's just how it tends to work out. So the discussion today, as we kind of go quarterback by quarterback, it's less about making predictions and doing hard and fast, like this guy is better than this guy. It's more so just talking about skill set and hoping for the betterment of all these guys that if they go to the right position, these individual skill sets are what could be maximized. I'm not gonna be saying definitively that any of them are QB1 or QB2 or QB3 because I mean, who the fuck knows at this point? Like, I don't think anybody knows at this point, but we're just gonna talk about what they do well, what they don't do well, and what hopefully they could turn into in the league. So we're gonna start it off here by talking about the guy that Again, I wouldn't really call him my QB1. He's more so just the guy that I think has probably the most potential out of anybody else in this class, if he hits that ceiling. And that is gonna be Malik Willis from Liberty. If you go back to the film room episode that I did a couple months ago on why first round quarterbacks have an obscenely high failure rate, like 70% last time I checked, I established a lot of the reasons for why these guys fail, as well as kind of took a look at my own process for how I evaluate quarterbacks and how I can kind of adapt that process for future classes. And what I established in that episode is that the success or failure of a quarterback prospect really comes down to three things, physical tools, coachability, and destination. Obviously, we have no idea what the destination for any of these quarterbacks is quite yet, but in terms of the other two categories that we do know, which is physical tools and, to a degree, coachability and instinct, to me, Malik Willis is the best combination of those things. He has remarkable physical talent when you look at mobility, arm strength, elusiveness, I mean, pretty much every single box you can check. He is crazy athletic with a crazy arm. Plus, he also happens to be a grade A person as well, that at least according to all the people that I know around him, he's extremely coachable, extremely willing to learn and grow and develop and all that kind of stuff. I know his quarterbacks coach. I know people that coached against him. I know that people that coached with him, all of them love Malik Willis as a person. And that's kind of an important piece to this puzzle because when you look at a lot of the young quarterbacks around the league that even if they were not ready to play coming out of college, or at least barely ready to play coming out of college, when you combine physical tools with just being a good, hardworking, humble person, that's kind of the mixture that tends to work out. If you're a physical freak and you're willing to be coached and you're willing to learn, you're probably gonna work out okay. So even though I know that there's a lot of landmines on the tape for Malik Willis, I mean, he got into a lot of bad habits because his pass protection was terrible. So he's constantly running from, in my opinion, decent pockets. He was making hero ball throws. There were some kind of inexplicable decisions where he wouldn't just take easy gains and he would try to stretch the field and get himself into trouble. Like there was legitimately some bad tape out there. I am not arguing against that. But if I'm just sticking to my new criteria here of physical tools, coachability, and God willing, good destination, I do think that Malik Willis is that guy this year. And kind of keeping destination in the back of my mind, by the way, all of the things that I'm talking about here are big reasons why I do think he is going to go second overall to Detroit. 
because when you look at likely destinations for rookie quarterbacks, I think that the Lions honestly are the best possible destination for a guy like Willis. They do not need to play him right away, and in fact, they don't even need to play him as a rookie at all because they have Jared Goff. And by the way, when you look at Jared Goff's contract, it's pretty easy for the team to get out of it in 2023 as well. So it kind of works out that way for the Lions too because it's a pretty easy transition money-wise. And then in terms of personnel around the quarterback, I mean, they have a pretty talented offensive line with a lot of really good players on it and some very good young players on it. They just took Penny Sewell last year. They have arguably the best center in football. They have some young guards that I really like. They have a couple running backs that I really like. And I think that they have some young receiving talent that I think is pretty underrated as well. Like just looking at their depth chart, I'm a big fan of DJ Chark. I think he unfortunately uh, had a rough 2021 with Jacksonville, like most people in Jacksonville, but I expect a pretty big bounce back in Detroit this year. And Amon Ross St. Brown, who by the way is a fellow modern day alumni, he went to my high school down in Southern California, and I've been watching him play since he was, uh, well, very, very young. I'll just say that. I've, I've been watching him for years and years and years. Always been a big fan of pretty much the whole St. Brown family, even though one of them went to Servite. So, you know, we don't talk about him, <coughs> Equidemius. Uh, but anyway, I, I do think that Amon Ross St. Brown had a pretty good rookie year, and I really love him as a slot option going forward. So they've got some weapons to work with as well. You know, you take a couple more in the draft this year and, you know, maybe the draft next year, see what you can add in free agency. You got running backs, you got offensive line, you got tight ends, like a really, really good tight end group. I think there's a lot there for Malik Willis in 2023. So yeah, sign me up for Malik Willis to Detroit at second overall. I know it might seem early, but when you look at talent, and when you look at the person that has that talent and the situation that he'd be going to, I think that's a perfect fit. And that'll bring us to number two on my quarterback list that I want to talk about today. And that is going to be Desmond Ritter from Cincinnati, who also kind of falls into that category of really good physical tools, really coachable kid, very, very smart, tons of experience. And I think if he goes to the right destination, he has a lot of upside. Obviously, he does not have the same arm talent of Malik Willis. In fact, I don't really even think it's close, but I still think it's above average, all things considered. What is well above average, though, I think is his mobility. Like, he is really, really fast, really explosive on his feet. I think he's tough to tackle in the open field. It's kind of interesting that Cincinnati didn't really design as many runs for him as maybe I would have, considering his mobility, but also there's the factor of, you know, wanting to protect him from injury and all that, so I kind of get it but he is really, really dangerous with the ball in his hands. So if he goes to a system that either emphasizes mobility or just kind of makes use of mobility, whether it's on bootlegs or zone reads or you know, quarterback draws, any of that kind of stuff, like something that just kind of puts his legs to use, I think that can be a really dynamic element just like it is with Malik Willis. And in terms of other strengths to his game, he sees the field really, really well. Like I would argue that his processor is probably the best in this class, which does make a lot of sense because he has started a ton of games over four years. So he's seen pretty much every kind of defense you can throw at him. He's played against a lot of really good and talented defenses throughout his career. Like he was not just beating up on cupcakes all year, every year. He played against some really top shelf defensive talent, some top shelf defensive coaches, and he shredded most of them, I would say. And even in the Alabama game, like I didn't think that he was confused by Nick Saban's defense at all. You know, maybe out executed, actually not even maybe, he was out executed. And there were some other problems in that game that we could talk about, but I didn't really think that he had any trouble seeing the field against all of these, you know, zone match concepts and the crazy pressures they were throwing at him. You know, I actually thought he saw the field really well. So I think from that standpoint, he could probably start day one and at least be competent on the field. Though I do think ultimately his success, again, given him going to a good destination, will come down to how his next coaching staff kind of fixes a couple of his minor issues, most notably being ball placement and a little bit of a slow or loopy release. And yes, I know if you watched that last film room episode about how I kind of misevaluated quarterbacks, 
I'm not kind of going all in on the mechanics argument here because I know that mechanics are not that important in the grand scheme of things, but I do want to point out that he does have a loop to his throwing motion that does kind of take a while. It makes it pretty easy for defensive linemen to time up his release and jump up and bat the ball down. He had 26 batted passes and four in the Alabama game alone, and two of those batted passes took away touchdowns because they just kept timing his throwing motion really easily because of that kind of looping motion. So that does matter, and hopefully they can quicken it up for him in the pros a little bit, just at least to cut down on some of those batted passes because that was really, really frustrating. And obviously, ball placement, I think, has also been a concern with Ritter for multiple years now. If you've been watching him and kind of, you know, anticipating when he was going to come out in the draft, like he's been a known quantity for a while now. And ball placement was always his biggest criticism. I think that accuracy legitimately has been spotty. Even this last year, even though there was improvement, it was still spotty. I think that sometimes he does not set up his receivers for good yards after catch situations because he kind of throws it behind him or throws it high or throws it low and just doesn't really allow them to catch it and go on the run without kind of wasting any strides. I think that sometimes he struggles to throw with proper leverage outside the numbers, you know, those kind of back shoulder throws or, you know, trying to drop it in the bucket up the field if your receiver gets a step. Sometimes he can struggle with that a little bit, or, you know, sometimes he'll kind of lead his guys back towards the post safety when you really want to drop it in over the shoulder outside the numbers. And I'm not saying that these are deal breakers, but I do think that these are things that need to be fixed, or I think that his ceiling could be capped a little bit at the next level. So overall, just kind of looking at Desmond Ritter as a prospect, he's really talented, highly mobile, handles messy pockets extremely well because of that mobility, great at processing defenses of all shapes and sizes and schemes, but he does have some moderate struggles with accuracy and kind of a slow release that leads to more batted balls than you'd like to see. Whether or not you personally consider that to be a first round pick resume is really up to you. But at least for me, I do expect him to go somewhere in the back half of the first round simply because his problems are not really a death sentence. And I do think that there are plenty of coaches out there who would gladly take him just for the upside. So those two guys at the top of my rankings have, in my opinion, probably the most tools to work with that could potentially be maximized by a well-run NFL organization. God willing, they go there. That's why I kind of have them at the top, so to speak, is because I think their ceilings in the right circumstances are very, very high. But there's still some other guys in this class that I think are going to be drafted in the top 100 picks because they also have certain things that I think are very appealing for teams. Either it's high quality backups or maybe potential starters down the line. It's tough to say with some of them, but I do think that many of them will probably go in the top 100 to maybe 120, 130 picks because there is potential there. So I do want to take the rest of this episode to talk about that rather large cluster of names because quite frankly, there's a lot of nuance in terms of how they can kind of be ordered and maybe their best destination and all that kind of stuff. But before I get into talking about all of them individually, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for today that helped to make this show and also this entire week of shows possible in the first place, and that is HelloFresh. It's officially springtime, which means right now is one of the best times of the year for fresh farm-to-table ingredients and recipes delivered right to your door from our friends over at HelloFresh. And all of the produce from HelloFresh was picked less than a week ago from when it enters your kitchen, so it is as fresh as you can possibly get it. Plus, all of the ingredients are pre-portioned for each recipe so there's no food waste. And getting your ingredients for home-cooked meals from HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than if you got the same stuff from a grocery store. So it's a lot more affordable as well for people who want to eat good quality food at home but without breaking the bank. They also offer veggie recipes, pescatarian options, and fit and wholesome options for those of us that have more specific diets. And in total, there are 50 different recipe options to choose from every single week which at least personally for me has been great because I tend to get bored when I eat the same thing over and over. So at least with HelloFresh, I never actually get tired of my food because they constantly have new stuff. If you yourself want to give HelloFresh a shot and see if you like it, you can always go to HelloFresh.com and use promo code FILMROOM16. That will give you 16 free meals as well as three free extra gifts across your first six boxes. Plus you'll get free shipping on that order. 
So again, if you want to try it out, that is HelloFresh.com, promo code FILMROOM16, and that will get you 16 free meals across those first six boxes, as well as free shipping on the order. Again, thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's show, and with that, let's get to the next group of quarterbacks. All right, next up on our list is Kenny Pickett from Pittsburgh, who to me is kind of a hybrid between Baker Mayfield and Mac Jones coming out of college. And I know that is going to sound like an insult to some people, and I promise you it is not. I'm just kind of looking at different strengths, different weaknesses, and what they remind me of. And he reminds me of two guys that actually did go in the first round. So it would not surprise me if Kenny Pickett himself went in the first round. But it also means that he does have some flaws that need to be addressed, or at least acknowledged by the team that takes him. So just kind of looking at strengths from a top level view, I do think that he has quick feet and he is pretty mobile to avoid the first rusher, just like Mac Jones and Baker Mayfield. He is a lot quicker in terms of movement ability than I think he's given credit for. And he's also a good thrower outside the pocket, just like Baker Mayfield. Like he has kind of an uncanny accuracy when he's rolling out that makes me think that he could be a very effective player on bootlegs or even just kind of in second phase plays where you're on scramble drills and you know you got to hit a guy 25 yards deep down the boundary. I think that he can do that kind of stuff pretty well just like Baker does. And also just like Mayfield and like Mac Jones, he is a very fast decision maker that is at his best in the quick passing game. And he can also do a lot of damage with schemed up deep ball opportunities once you kind of get into certain coverage looks because he is a very accurate thrower but I don't really consider him a dynamic threat in terms of stretching the field beyond those schemed up deep ball opportunities. Like there's a big difference in my book between throwing a blaze out from the far hash where you know, you're know you driving the ball all the way across the field and it's a very tight window or you know hitting a whole shot against cover two where the corner is sinking and you have almost no room to make the throw or you're trying to hit a bang eight against cover three where the free safety is leaning and you know he's ready to take off your receiver's head and you have a very small window to throw it up high and kind of protect him from contact while also getting the ball there with velocity like those are the kinds of throws that very few quarterbacks can make especially at the college level and I don't really see Pickett making those kinds of throws. But in terms of, again, the schemed up deep ball opportunities where you get quarters and you're running a pin post where the safety's coming down and then you got a post behind it and there's nobody in the middle of the field. So you can just kind of lob the ball up and let the receiver run under it. That kind of stuff, like what Mac Jones did at Alabama, yeah, he can do that just fine. So I think if you're scheming up those kinds of looks, he can execute them really well but you should not confuse him with Malik Willis or Carson Strong or even to a degree Desmond Ritter who does have those kinds of throws on tape. It is not the same level of arm talent. Again, I could easily see him going in the first round because the two guys I compare him to also went really high in the top 15 picks, but I also think that kind of looking at the grand scheme of things, he's more of a quarterback that you win with rather than a quarterback that you win because of, if that makes sense. He could easily surpass that evaluation, of course. Like, I would not put it past him to surprise us, just like he surprised us all in 2021. But I personally see him as a second round pick because of his arm limitations and because of his kind of jittery tendencies in the pocket where he'll run away from pressure that uh, isn't really there, to put it mildly. Like, he does kind of have some bad habits there, too. So, again, I see him as a second round pick. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Top 10... Top 10 is a little bit rich for me, but we'll see. And that brings us to Carson Strong, who is fourth on our list. And he's kind of the opposite of Kenny Pickett in a lot of ways. Like he has unbelievable arm strength. Like it might even be stronger than Malik Willis, to be honest. But unlike Pickett, he is literally a statue in the pocket because of how messed up his knee is. And for those of you that aren't aware of it, this is actually a pretty old injury, even going back to his high school days, or at least about his high school time period. And he has been playing on this thing forever. He finally had surgery on it before last season, and it should have kept him out for all of 2021. But instead, he wanted to play with his teammates and have one last year with them. So he decided to rehab in six months and then come back early and play on it, not even remotely at 100%. And you could tell that he was pretty much just on a peg leg all season long. Like, he could not move at all. If you got even a little bit of pressure on him, he could not escape it. Like, he was pretty good at manipulating the pocket because he had to be. Like, he could not operate outside of the pocket. But if you got even somewhat disciplined rush lanes and gave him nowhere to go, 
he was not going to break any tackles. He was not going to convert any first downs. Like he was just, he was not going anywhere. He couldn't move and he probably still can't move now. Like I just don't think that mobility is a part of his game at all. But that being said, from the pocket as a kind of statuesque Nick Foles-ish quarterback with a howitzer for an arm, I mean, he can spin it. He can make some crazy throws. There was a third and 20 against Kansas State where I mean, I have no idea how he fitted into the window he did. He split like three defenders. It was the wildest throw that I saw any quarterback prospect make this entire year. And he does that kind of stuff every single week. So watching him on tape is really exciting for that reason, even though he brings absolutely nothing to the ground game. Now, I will also say that he does come from a pure air raid system run by Matt Mummy, who is the son of Hal Mummy, by the way, one of the architects of the air raid offense going all the way back to his time at Valdosta State with Mike Leach, and I've done multiple videos on that at this point. And if you've been around this channel for long enough and you watch those videos, you know that being an air raid quarterback used to be a big deal to me in a negative way, but not really anymore because most NFL teams actually run air raid concepts anyway. So it's not really that drastic of a transition like it used to be 10 to 15 years ago. So overall, there is a lot to like with Carson Strong. He's got incredible arm talent. I think he is one of the best pure throwers of the football in this class. I think he's smart. I think he runs the air raid at least very well. I think he's very competent at it. I never really saw him in terms of decision making, making quote unquote the wrong decision because a lot of the air raid is just kind of read routes and, you know, identifying defenses and just kind of throwing against leverage, you know, leading your receivers into space and letting them play basketball on grass is the comparison used. And I think he operated that at a high level. So in terms of, you know, can he run West Coast stuff? I don't know, maybe, like I think that's up to the teams themselves to kind of determine when they interview him. I personally did not interviewed him, but I also have no reason to believe that he can't run West Coast stuff with West Coast verbiage and protections and progressions and all that kind of stuff. It's just going to be a, a thing that teams have to decide for themselves. So again, just kind of looking bird's eye view overall package here, amazing arm talent, really good leader, works hard. Seems like he has a, a pretty high level understanding of at least his own offense at Nevada. And he's a pretty accurate thrower, at least within the confines of that system as well. He's a pretty good quarterback. I think that without medical concerns, he would probably be a slam dunk day two pick, probably in the second round, just considering the arm talent. But with the medical, I, I got nothing. I have no idea what his knee looks like. It's going to be up to the doctors. Some of them might say that he can't be drafted. Some of them might say he's okay. So I think that on draft weekend, we're going to get an idea of what those medical reports look like based on how high he goes, if he even gets drafted at all. If he goes super late or undrafted, that means his knee is probably fucked. If he goes on day two, that means his knee is probably okay. So all that being considered, I guess we'll see. And then to kind of round out the remaining quarterbacks that I want to talk about today, and obviously these are not all of the rest of the quarterbacks. There's still Bailey Zapp, there's Jack Cohn, Skylar Thompson, De'Aaron King, uh, you know, Brock Purdy, Dustin Crum. Like there's a lot of other dudes that are probably going to go either day three or, you know, maybe be priority UDFAs. I'm not going to talk about all of them because I see them as purely backups with probably no starting potential. But all of the other three that I do want to talk about are also likely going to be backups, but I do think they could possibly eventually be starters. And that's going to be Matt Corral from Ole Miss, Sam Howell from North Carolina, and Caleb Ellaby from Western Michigan. And the reason why I have all of them grouped together in this tier, I guess you can call it, and why I'm going to be talking about all of them at the same time is because I have literally no idea how to evaluate them. When you look at the offenses that these guys played in, it was a lot of RPOs, and when it wasn't RPOs, it was, you know, screens behind the line of scrimmage, it was goal balls down the sideline where it's a one-on-one -on -one opportunity, and either you make the play or you don't, but it's a relatively safe deep ball. And there's just not a whole lot of, quote, NFL throws in these offenses, and I just, I don't know what to do with it. Like, at least with Carson Strong, even though they were pure air raid, there were at least some NFL-style throws in that offense. Same thing with Kenny Pickett, same thing with Ritter, same thing with Malik Willis. Like, we saw those drive throws that are really important for NFL scouts. I never really saw that at Ole Miss. I didn't see that at North Carolina, and I didn't see that at Western Michigan. 
Like Corral in particular, and I'm gonna be focusing on him because he's kind of the poster child for this and he gets the most attention, I would say, out of all these prospects in this group. When you look at his throws past the line of scrimmage in this offense, he was throwing RPOs 36% of the time. Like it's fake numbers. Like none of this shit is real. Like you're just reading box counts to know when to throw and when to hand off, or you're reading the leverage of a defender to know when to throw a glance route. It's not the same as what you see in the NFL. Like that shit doesn't work in the NFL. You can't run RPOs 36% of the time. It worked for one year in 2017 in Philadelphia and they won a Super Bowl and then it never worked like that again. Like you'll see it sprinkled in, but it's not the basis of an NFL offense anymore because defense is adjusted. Like you just can't do that at the NFL level. And by the way, I am not saying that Matt Corral is incapable of running an NFL offense or even anything close to an NFL offense where, you know, you have to make drive throws and, you know, make left to right, top to bottom progressions and even the air raid stuff that we see. Like, I'm not saying that he can't do that. What I'm saying is that we haven't seen him do that yet, so I don't know how to evaluate this. Like, I know I talk about, you know, tools and coachability are what matters, but we haven't really got to see him show off the tools, so I, I don't know what to do here. I know he's mobile, and I know he has arm strength, but again, without being able to see him make NFL throws, how can I really evaluate the arm strength? Again, I am not saying that he's a bad prospect, I'm just saying I don't know what to do here. And when you dive into the numbers even deeper, I can roll in Caleb Ellaby into that same conversation. Like they had the exact same number of non-RPO throws past the line of scrimmage, i.e. normal throws that you expect in an offense that aren't just kind of fake RPO numbers. They had the exact same number of attempts, the exact same number of completions, the exact same completion percentage, and they were within five yards of each other, 1,940 to 1,945. So Ellaby and Corral, who, you know, you look at mock drafts and grades and all that kind of stuff, they're like five rounds apart from each other, and they have the same fucking production. So what do we do here? Does this mean that we're looking at Caleb Ellaby as like the same type of prospect that Matt Corral is when they both have a bunch of fake production? Am I going to be dinging Sam Howell because he throws glance routes and go balls really well, but we don't get to see anything else in that North Carolina offense? I don't know. I'm at a loss. I just, I don't know how to grade these guys. At least with everybody else, you know, that I've talked about so far, we got to see stuff on tape, whether good or bad, that translated to what we know NFL offenses like to do. I just can't say the same for these three. So in terms of like evaluating physical tools, I'm just going off how they threw at the combine. I'm going off how they looked at the pro day, because at least we got to somewhat see something there. But it's not live bullets. It's not live game action. I'm just going off of, of, of what little we've seen here, and I'm flying blind. I would not be shocked at all if they end up as starters and they do well. Like, that That would not be a surprise whatsoever to me because, you know, at least they throw good deep balls, and I think that, you know, lb has got a quick release and Corral's mobile. Like, there's some stuff that we've seen that I think is, is positive. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if they start and do well. But I also wouldn't be surprised if they're just backups for their whole career because a lot of the production was meaningless. You might as well flip a coin because at least according to my own history of evaluating quarterbacks, that'll probably be more accurate than me. Like just to be honest, it probably will be. So uh, we'll revisit this in three years and we'll see if I missed something. I probably did. And we'll take the opportunity to learn from it. But at least as of right now, I don't know what to do. So I'm just kind of leaving them in this group right here. If you want to give your own opinion down in the comment and let me know what you think, you know, maybe you have some extra context you can add. Maybe you have some other information that I haven't taken into account. You know, maybe you just have some advice on, on how to read the situation here. I would love to hear your opinion. I would love to learn what you guys have to offer because I am not a perfect evaluator. And, uh, you know, maybe we can kind of uh, think tank this one together and figure these guys out before the draft next week. I would love to do that. So yeah, let me know what you guys think in the comments below because I could sure use the help. And there you have it. That is all of our offensive position rankings for the year. That wraps up quarterback. Yesterday was offensive line. And before that we had running back and tight end and wide receiver. We talked about a lot of guys this week and we're gonna be talking about, I think potentially even more next week with the defensive position rankings, which are gonna be coming out 
Same format as this week, one position per day. Then we got the mock draft special coming shortly after that. And then we got the draft live streams over on the Bootleg Football Podcast YouTube channel that you can once again subscribe to at the description below or in the pinned comment below. That's where we're going to be doing all the live streams is over on the podcast channel. So there is a lot more content to come. This is probably the most stuff that I'm putting out in a three week period, uh, probably ever. So, you know, pour one out for Slater, my editor. He's been working his ass off all week to get these all out for you. And we very much appreciate him. And I very much appreciate him. So thank you for everything you're doing, Slater. And thank you to our sponsors over at HelloFresh for also helping to make this show possible. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys very soon with those defensive position rankings. And until then, cheers.